the Western uh, uh, writers uh, are more independent. So maybe there is a, a uh, renaissance. Landscape, empty spaces, outdoors, and I think things like that are reflected in the difference between Eastern and Western writing. I try to devise stories that will, in these Navajo series particularly, pull readers into a culture uh, and past things I want them to see so that they, I do teach them something about a, a, a very interesting culture that I think all Americans should know something about. But it's got to be germane to the plot. I'm a Roman Catholic. I disagree frequently with the, with the hierarchy, but I'm, I'm, uh, my faith is important to me. And uh, when you find people, and you find a lot of them on Indian reservations, who have a faith and a belief, I like those people. I have a great sense of humor. They value wit. So do I. I grew up with all the same kind of things that Navajos grew up with and live in the Hogan. We didn't have indoor plumbing until I was a big teenager. We didn't have a telephone. We didn't have electricity until, again, later on in life. Uh, they rather quickly recognized me as a member of the underclass, you know? On that plaque on the wall was given be, to me by the Navajo tribe as an expression of appreciation and friendship for authentically portraying the strength and dignity of traditional Navajo culture. One thing that's probably characteristic of Western writing, or at least more common than it is in the East, is the landscape being germane to the plot. In this book, and in the passage I'm about to read from Thief of Time, the problem is finding a place in an empty, roadless landscape, and the plot turns on that problem. This passage also shows the touchy relationship between the, my two police characters, uh, Joe Lee Porn and Jim Chi. The Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico border country is a maze of washes, gulches, draws, and canyons, thousands of them. And in their sheltered, sun-facing alcoves, literally scores of thousands of Anasazi sites. What Et City had given Lee Point was like a description of a house in a big city with no idea of its street address. That narrowed it to an area bigger than Connecticut, occupied by maybe 5,000 humans. And all he had was a site description that might be as false as its location obviously was. Perhaps she had done better. An odd young man, she, smart apparently, alert, but slightly, slightly what? Bent? Not exactly. It wasn't just a business of trying to be a medicine man, a following utterly uncongruous with police work. He was a romantic, Leaporn decided. That was it, a man who followed dreams. She seemed to think an island of 180,000 Navajos could live the old way in a white ocean. Perhaps 20,000 of them could, if they were happy on mutton, cactus, and pinyon nuts. Not practical. Navajos had to compete in the real world. The Navajo way didn't teach them competition. Far from it. I've been accused by critics a time or two of, of uh, stopping the action to describe thunderstorms and clouds, and I admit a weakness for that. Lee Porn walked. The sun emerged. In places, the sandstone landscape was littered with hail. In places, the hot stone steamed. The sun was low now and warm against the side of Lee Porn's face. The afterglow faded from the cliff tops. He walked tensely, stopping every few yards, both to listen and to make sure that his breathing remained slow and low. Once he was startled by a sudden scurrying of a rodent, and then, mid-stride, he heard a voice. He stood motionless, straining to hear more. It was a man's voice coming from somewhere down canyon. Then he heard in the darkness the sound of running 
and a panting breath. It was coming directly toward him. Lee Porn managed to thumb back the pistol hammer to full cock and half raised the 38. Then, looming out of the darkness, came the bulk of the dog. Lee Porn was able to lunge sideways toward the split clip and jerk the trigger. Amid the thunder of the pistol shot, the dog was on him. It struck him shoulder high. Because of Lee Porn's lunge, the impact was glancing. Lee Porn found himself scrambling frantically upward over the boulders and brush. He squirmed upward, reaching a narrow shelf. There, the dog couldn't possibly reach. He turned and looked down. He felt the nausea of a system overloaded with adrenaline. He was safe for the moment from the dog, but he was totally exposed to the dog's owner. I don't have, in most of my books, much violence. The mystery tends to be not so much who did it as why it's being done. I, I was a rifleman in the infantry in World War II, and, and you saw a lot of death. I won a couple of decorations, and then I was, got badly wounded. And then I worked as a police reporter. So you're working around the bad guys. I worked myself in the corners all the time where you don't know exactly what you're going to do next. Well, I'm never going to get involved. I was really in stuck issue. on the dark wind. Couldn't find a way to motivate my policeman to be where he needed to be. And uh, so Marie said, why don't you go out on a reservation? And while we were out there, or just before we got out there, somebody had vandalized a windmill. Odd thing to do in dry country. Why would anybody vandalize a windmill? I suddenly been, we could see why somebody might vandalize a windmill, and we hurried home and I finished the book. And it's, the whole book revolves around that vandalized windmill. I've written a, about as much, maybe more nonfiction than fiction. I, I've had a book of essays published. I've written all sorts of the long pieces that hold apart the photos in coffee table books. I have a weakness for empty places. But if you share my taste for isolation, late summer or early spring are ideal times to visit. I like to climb down from the rim to White House ruins, take off my shoes and socks, and splash through the shallow water to the cottonwoods under the cliff dwelling. And up and down the stream, painted on the tough, dark deposits of desert varnish that stain the sandstone, are the pictographs. The work of basket maker Anasazi, Hopi, and Navajo. You wander along the cliffs, finding abstractions, snakes, birds, the familiar humpback shape of Cocapelli playing his flute, a frog, a large man with arms raised in supplication. I think these are messages left for us that we've forgotten how to read. The cliffs remind me of how little space I occupy, the pictographs of how little time. 